So we'll get rolling here, guys, um, guys and gals. I appreciate everyone for coming out today. Um, <clears throat> our new reality, unfortunately, lately is we cannot do these meetings face to face. So these webinars are the next best thing. So I appreciate everybody taking the time to uh, be a part of this. Just to let you know who's speaking to you today, uh, my name is Blake Weatherall. For those of you that don't know, I am the regional sales manager for Alpine Fertilizers in Saskatchewan, Manitoba. Uh, a little background about myself. Grew up on a farm in southeast Saskatchewan where I still uh, am involved with our family farm down there. Went to the U of S, um, took my agronomy degree there, spent a couple years with Richardson Pioneer right out of university. And then the last 10 years have all been with Alpine. Eight of those years as a district sales manager for Northwest Saskatchewan and the last two years as the regional sales manager. <clears throat> Little history about the company itself, the Alpine brand, um, who we are, for those of you that maybe don't know, I won't spend much time on this, but we are a manufacturer and distributor of liquid fertilizer products. So everything I'm gonna talk about today is gonna be liquid. Uh, the exception, which I'm not really talking too much about, would be the molybdenum, which is a dry product that we dissolve into the liquid fertilizer. Everything else is in the liquid form. We also supply the fertilizer kits used to apply the starter nutrition. Um, the Alpine brand itself has been around for over 47 years, and that would be our Canadian brand. And then uh, we are Nature's in the U.S., and that brand has been around for over 70 years. So as a whole, we are Nature's Alpine Solutions, and we're the largest hot mix liquid company in North America. Uh, some changes happened for us this past fall. We were actually purchased by uh, a very large company, uh, by the name of Wilbur Ellis um, out of the States and that's going to bring on some exciting things for us I think here in the near future so some of you may have heard of that um, this past fall so that's that's who that's who owns us now and we are just a division of Wilbur Ellis now. Production facilities are Canadian facilities we have one in New Hamburg Ontario um, and then the Bell Plain Saskatchewan plant which supplies all of the Western Canadian market as well as some of the northern states um, right now we're actually undergoing a big expansion here at Bell Plain, putting up a big warehouse. On the left hand side of this picture, there will be a big building there now. Uh, we're putting in another a reactor. Uh, we'll be able to make two separate products at the same time, which is going to be nice, especially when we transition from the starter side of the season into the foliar side. This will give us the ability to make two products, two separate products at the same time. So that's pretty cool. Um, also, we'll be able to jug products there in the future. Right now, everything comes from New Hamburg is shipped out in terms of uh, jug product. So in terms of logistics, this is going to be pretty big for us going forward as well. So the topic of discussion today is going to be maximizing fertility and seeding efficiencies. So if you have questions throughout, feel free to uh, unmute your phone and ask anytime. Or if you're more comfortable, you can text your questions to Shane Falk. Um, that's his number there at the bottom. Feel free to text them to him. He can ask me at any time throughout, or we can ask them at the end of the com or at the end of the presentation. Or there's also at the bottom of the screen, there's a little comment section there uh, with the chat. I can't really see that throughout the presentation, but I can look at those after. If you have any questions, you can throw them in there as well. So. So the topic of discussion in terms of maximizing fertility, we're, we're looking at how we can increase efficiency so we can get the most out of every dollar you spend on fertilizer, um, get the most of your equipment, what are some things we can do there, um, and get, get the most out of that nutrient that we're putting either in the ground or through the leaf. Um, so to get things started, I like to talk about thinking outside the box. Now, not that anything I'm going to discuss today is really that extremely outside of the box but there's still some people in the industry that maybe aren't as open to certain things new technologies and different things and and i just want to keep in mind or want everybody to keep in mind even if you can take away a little something from this presentation uh, something that gets mentioned that maybe fills a gap in your operation that you see might be a fit um, keep an open mind about some of those options right there's there's always ways to improve and do things differently. I don't expect everyone to leave this presentation and, and you know, go out and do everything that we talk about today. 
Um, with a lot of our customers, it starts with trying something, get in maybe starting with the foliar product and then transition to the starter and build from there. So in terms of what uh, the layout of the presentation is going to be, we're going to spend some time talking about balanced nutrition. Uh, we'll start with the starter nutrition, which is going to be phosphorus based conversation. Then we'll get into the foliar nutrition and then we'll spend some time um, talking about our new potassium K tech technology that we're pretty excited about. So we talk about balance. Um, this is a very common picture. I'm sure a lot of you have seen this before. If you've ever been a part of any uh, fertility presentation, um, it's Leibig's law of minimum which essentially all that means is uh, whatever is the, the, the most limiting factor is going to determine uh, your yield, right? So in a lot of cases, especially for us in Western Canada this past year, uh, moisture was a big concern. Early in the year, we had the issue of it being way too dry. And then we all know what happened basically across North America this fall. Um, we had excess moisture. So I do understand that there's only so much you can do depending on what your uh, moisture conditions are unless you're, you have irrigation, but that doesn't mean there aren't certain things we can do with nutrition to help mitigate different stresses, which we'll talk about more so when we get um, into the starter and foliar side of things. So I do find that a lot of people um, or a lot of, of, of growers sometimes get a little bit too focused on nitrogen as that driver for yield. Um, obviously, it's very important, but it's important to realize that it doesn't matter how much nitrogen you apply. If something else is, is a limiting factor, there's another nutrient in there that is limiting yield. It doesn't matter how much nitrogen you put on. Um, that's not going to be what drives your yield. So this is just the idea behind that. As you balance your nutrition, you'll see the yield increase. So that chart on the left, um, as you can see, as we add nitrogen, you get up to 300 pounds there. Um, we'll be build yield just with the nitrogen. Then as you add phosphorus, build it again, potassium and then sulfur. So this is just driving home that point that a balanced nutrition program is going to give you a better result than just focusing on certain nutrients. Mulder's chart, this is also something you've probably seen a lot of before. Um, basically, the focus for us today are going to be on uh, phosphorus and potassium. So the main thing to consider when you look at those is, as you can see, there's a lot of interactions with those two specific nutrients with other uh, compounds and other minerals in the soil. And that plays a big role in availability of those nutrients. And we'll kind of talk about how we can combat those issues with some different things that we're doing. So getting the most of your nutrients, um, most of you have probably seen this before and you would relate it to the 4R, which just means uh, are the nutrients in an available form? Um, are they in the correct rate? Are they applied when the crop needs it most? And is it accessible to the crop in terms of placement, right? So this isn't really something new. The whole 4R uh, marketing side of it is, is you know relatively new within the past few years but this is something that us as a company has been doing for for a number of years so we do this in a few different ways um, we do it with the phase nutrition program is, is kind of the way we've coined it it begins with the starter nutrition which would be addressing uh, nutrients through the air drill or through the planter um, and then following it up with foliar nutrition which could be through fertigation in some cases if irrigation is an option or through a uh, ground rig or high clearance sprayer. So the concept looks something like this and this would be an extreme example but the idea is you begin with the soil test gives us an idea of what nutrients maybe we can address with the starter um, along with your base fertility program and we can look at that and we can see, you know, is there a potential deficiency that we could see that we can address early on in the starter, uh, whether that be micronutrients. Typically for Western Canada, especially the carriers for those products are going to be the Alpine G22 and the Alpine HKW18. Those are going to be the phosphate based carriers for these uh, added nutrients. 
Then ideally we could pull a tissue test once the crops of the ground, maybe the one or two leaf stage prior to going out there with a the herbicide. We can look at that, see how we did with the upfront starter package, see if there's any nutrition that we can address um, when we're going out there with a the herbicide. Gives you the option to then foliar feed that crop. Ideally take another tissue test, see how we did with that foliar fertility. And then we have the option again to feed that crop as we go from vegetative to reproductive stage. And I'll talk about why that's important as we get into the foliar side of things. So this would be the extreme concept. I know not everybody's going to do it to this extreme. Um, we do have growers that will do it like this for a couple crops, a couple different fields. They're not doing this across their whole farm in terms of the tissue testing um, every single time, but they'll use it in conjunction with their soil test to try and gauge what they think they might need. So it all starts with phosphorus. We know that phosphorus is essential for all living organisms. Um, it's important for all these things listed on this slide. Root development's a big one. Uh, enzymes and nucleic acids, proteins, um, maturity. We all know that those are very important. The thing that I focus a lot on, um, and I sum it up as it's very important for energy and energy storage and transfer and transfer of nutrients within that plant. So you'll hear me use that word a lot in terms of phosphorus being tied to energy and we'll get into kind of what that means here shortly. So what factors affect the availability of phosphorus in the soil? <clears throat> it's going to be soil pH, so high, neutral or low is going to have an effect. Uh, soil moisture and temperature. The form that the phosphorus is in already in the soil in terms of uh, whether it's calcium phosphates, aluminum phosphates, and we'll get into that here shortly. The biology, uh, so the mic microbial activity in that soil is going to play a factor. And then the form and the placement of the fertilizer that we're using. So in terms of soil pH, um, as you see here, as you get into the lower pH soils, iron and aluminum are going to be the culprits in terms of the tie-up of your phosphorus. On the high end of things, calcium is going to be the culprit. So I'm used to dealing with mostly high pH, high calcium soils, um, high clay content. That's what a lot of the Saskatchewan Western Canadian soils are. Uh, there's some pockets of lower pH, and I know there's some pockets and areas in, in Alberta, which would be on the extreme lower side of things. Um, but as a rule, I mean, unless you're kind of in that neutral pH zone, right around 7, 6, 5 to 7, there's going to be a lot of tie up with these different elements with your phosphorus. The effects of soil temperature, um, interestingly enough, when you drop from 21 degrees C to 13 C, the availability reduces by almost 70%. So I think we all know that we're not seeding into uh, 21 degree soil, um, especially when we begin seeding. Acres are getting larger. Um, we know that the season seems to be getting shorter. So guys are getting out there as soon as they can. And when you're doing that, the phosphorus that is already in the soil may not actually be available to you because it's tied up and there's not a lot of microbial activity happening. So what's in the soil is necessarily not available to that plant. So that's why it's important that we're putting for fertility down at that time. So the actual phosphorus in the soil, uh, when we talk about um, what's already there, so there's two forms essentially of organic and inorganic forms. Um, the inorganic forms are the only form that the plant can use. The organic forms, which would be your living microbes and different things like that, um, organic matter, those things have to go through a process of mineralization before they can be available to the plant. And that takes biological activity to happen. So when we talk about, about soil temperature, if your soil temperature is low and your moisture conditions are a certain uh, certain way, there's not a lot of that mineralization happening. So that release of that phosphorus early in the season is maybe not necessarily there. And then on the other side of things, on the right side, this is where you get a lot of the tied up minerals and tied up phosphorus. You have your iron, aluminum uh, oxides and phosphates and your calcium phosphates. And these also have to be broke down before the plant can use those particular compounds and they have to go into the soil solution. So 
the point of this slide is to, is to just let you know when you see your soil test and you're looking at the available phosphate level or phosphorus level on that soil test, that is about 0.5 to 1% of the total phosphate pool. They're not testing for the total soil phosphate bank. What they're testing for is what's already in solution, which can be used right away, as well as some of the, the uh, not as tightly bound um, minerals, which would be your iron, aluminum, oxides, and phosphates that will be released in season. Um, so that's something to keep in mind because a lot of guys, and especially in Western Canada, we see a lot of very low um, phosphate readings on soil tests and a lot of guys get panicked and, and rightfully so. I know we do need a certain level of phosphorus to produce our crops, but keep in mind there's more than that in your soil. They're just showing what's available. So when we talk about the form of the fertilizer used and applied, we know that plants absorb phosphorus as orthophosphate ions. That's just science. That's the way it's always been. Um, your dry products are going to be orthophosphates, but the difference is they're dry versus a liquid. A lot of the other liquids on the market are going to be primarily polyphosphates, um, even though there are a few companies that we've run into that like to market their product as an orthophosphate. What we've found when we've tested a lot of these products is they are still primarily uh, polyphosphates. So they are 50% or more polyphosphates um, and 50% or less orthophosphates. So technically I would not necessarily consider those a liquid orthophosphate starter. And why that's important is because that polyphosphate actually has to convert to an orthophosphate in the soil before it can be used by that plant. And that takes time and temperature for that to happen. So we talk about why form and quality is important. Um, some people will say, well, it doesn't matter. A pound of P is a pound of P, a pound of K is a pound of K and so on and so forth. Well, I would argue these are both tomatoes, but they're obviously of a different quality. Same goes with water. Um, these two glasses of water. I know if I was to choose which one I was going to drink, Quality would matter to me. The one on the left is obviously of a higher quality than the one on the right. And in terms of the form, um, if I'm dying of thirst and you hand me an ice cube versus a bottle of water, I'm probably going to prefer that bottle of water. The ice cube will eventually do the job, um, but it will do it much slower, right? So that's kind of the whole concept of how form and quality come into play. To relate it more so to the quality of the fertilizer products, so if you look at this picture, this is a picture I swiped from one of our colleagues out of the States. Um, all of these bottles are the same in NPK analysis of 624.6. So it's quite obvious to me that there are differences between these products themselves. And when you're trying to put a liquid starter through a small orifice, quality definitely matters. We're not even talking about the agronomics and the other things that are in that product. We're just talking about physically being able to get that fertilizer down with the seed, right? So that's obviously very important. So what you get with the Alpine products would be the Alpine G22 and the Alpine HKW18, which are our uh, primary starter products. They're both a complete blend of nitrogen. The HKW is 100% orthophosphate. The G22 is 65 to 70% orthophosphate. And both of them have nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in them low in salt content and impurities. The other important thing, non-corrosive, a lot of guys um, that we get converted to liquid, the, one of their fears is the, the corrosion. Um, the Alpine products are non-corrosive, um, obviously different than something like a UAN, which is very corrosive, and that's what guys worry about. They see guys that uh, have used liquid nitrogen, or maybe they've used liquid nitrogen on their operation in the past. And that is a big fear, but that's not an issue with the Alpine. Also in the G22, we have a starter level of micronutrients, which makes that a little bit different. Um, zinc, manganese, and molybdenum in there as well. So we talk about form, and this would be uh, dry versus a liquid. I show this because we have a number of replication. This comes out of Eastern Canada. So 524 replications, um, 3.1 bushel advantage to the Alpine G24, which would be kind of the equivalent to the G22 product out here. And we're just showing the different form of that nutrient in terms of a liquid versus a dry, a liquid orthophosphate versus a dry product, right? 
Now when we compare forms of liquid, so the polyphosphate versus an orthophosphate, here you have the alpine G24 product, which is a high ortho product, versus the 1034, which is a high polyphosphate product. 230 replications, 5.2 bushel average. So what we're trying to show you here is that, that the form that the nutrient is in does matter, right? And here's a, a little bit more local data. This is a, a trial from last year done in Manitoba. Um, this is five US gallons of 1034 up against five US gallons of G22. So you're actually getting more pounds of actual phosphate down with the 1034 at that five gallons because it's a higher percentage of phosphorus, but we're still getting a yield bump. And really the difference there is the poly versus the ortho content plus the potassium and the micronutrients in the G22. So obviously what I'm trying to drive home here is that the source of the fertilizer does matter. We talk about nutrient movement in the soil. We know nitrogen moves relatively quickly. Phosphates are fairly uh, immobile or very immobile and potassium is slightly more mo mobile than, than uh, phosphorus. This is nothing new. So with the Alpine starter program, what we're after is placing that product right in the seed row where we have the highest concentration and the highest chance of that root coming into contact with that, with that fertility, right? So that's what we want. And in my opinion, there, there really is no other need to load that seed row with a whole bunch of other fertilizer at that time. Put a good starter there, get that crop going. It will go to the side band or mid row band or whatever top dress, whatever you're doing, and it will go get the rest of those nutrients. There's no point in overloading that seed row, especially when we get into some of these drier conditions like we've seen um, the past couple of years, right? So this is what we would commonly see. Uh, we can drive root growth with our product. Here's another visual. So when we talk about placement, um, there's the odd uh, equipment manufacturer that claims that, well, it doesn't have to be in the seed row, um, you know, close is close enough. We would argue when we see something like this, which is what we saw last year with one of our customers, the only difference here is the 13 and a half liters of the G22 in the seed row. Uh, both of these strips have 58 pounds of side banded map. So the only difference here is the fact that that extra alpine is in the seed row. And this was just a, a, a whoopsie. Um, the customer forgot to turn his alpine pump on. So an accidental test strip. And, and this is not uncommon to see something like this. So how we go about getting that placement done, there's a number of different ways we can do it. Um, but essentially we want that product right in the seed row. There's a couple different placement tube options. Pretty much any opener you can think of, um, we've done. This is what it looks like. <clears throat> this would be that 13 and a half liters uh, on a 12 inch spacing. So you're gonna get a consistent stream in the seed row, which is what we're after for increasing feeding sites. On the equipment side of things, as I mentioned, we're, we're very involved in that side of it as well. So any customer, any grower that has um, a drill that they're interested in setting up, chances are we've got pictures of it and we've got somebody that has set that up before. These are some different tank options. You have the saddle tanks there in the picture on the left, uh, the onboard tank right on the frame of the drill on the right, a couple other different options. I'm not gonna show everything, but if there's something you're interested in, chances are your district sales manager will have done that before. You also have the option of liquid caddies. Lots of guys pull these, um, fill that up. We're, we're anywhere between 13 and a half to 18 liters an acre. So you fill one of these caddies up and a lot of guys will see it all day, um, only filling once. Here's just a picture of the field delivery unit options. Um, lots of different options for getting product to the field. The manifold system looks something like this. You have a couple different options. On the left, you have your on-row uh, monitoring with the Wilger system, and then on the right, a uh, little simpler system, which is the block manifold. Both do the same do do the same thing. There's an orifice in there that controls your rate. It's just speed over pressure. We also have our equipment rebate program, where we will offer up to two thousand dollars back on the cost of your equipment setup. So. Your average kit is going to cost anywhere between, call it $3,000 or on the low end, maybe a smaller corn planter, maybe only $1,500.
all the way up to maybe $4,500 on some of these bigger drills. So it's based on a per run basis. And we will pay back up to $2,000 on the cost of that kit as a rebate at the end of the year based on how much fertilizer you buy. So it's three cents a liter on every liter you buy over a period of two years until you max that out. So the other thing that we can offer is increasing efficiencies once you have this application kit installed. What else can we do with it? Well, it obviously gives you the ability to add different things. So we have a lot of guys that will blend in different micronutrients based on soil test. Um, the micronutrients we're blending, and this is important because we are an orthophosphate, the EDTA chelated forms of micronutrients blend very well. Uh, there are other forms of micronutrients out there that do not blend very well with orthophosphates. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. We know that we get superior nutrient efficiency by blending that liquid micronutrient into another liquid because we know we get a lot of better feeding sites and the placement is a lot better. And then we also have the ability to add other products such as inoculants, which we'll get into more detail here shortly, uh, biologicals, lignohumates, different things like that, that we can add at the same time that should be in the seed row anyway. Give you an idea of the efficiencies of the micronutrients. So what we did here was, this was a trial we did a few years ago that I was a part of. We had the soil test came back um, measuring low in boron, 0.5 ppm, which would be considered low. The soil test recommendation was one actual pound of boron should be used there. So the 2.8 liters an acre of our boron would be one actual pound. Now that is a lot more than we would ever actually recommend or apply, but we knew that. And then the three quarters of a liter, which is the 0.75 on the left, that is kind of what we would recommend for that one pound per acre. And basically what it showed was the plot on the right, that entire plot was set back. And especially early on because of essentially boron toxicity because we over applied that boron in that seed row. But what it showed is every single plant was set back. So it showed that the placement is very good. If you were to do that with a granular product, you may get toxicity at one plant here um, and then another two feet away, maybe the next plant that happens to be beside that prill. So what that shows you is that all those plants are not getting access to that product, right? And when you're doing it with a liquid, you get that. And this is this is some plants we dug up. Obviously, the one on the left, which is the high rate, obviously there's some growth differences. Everything seeded the same day. The only difference was the boron. This was the yield results from this. So we had a almost three and a half bushel yield response to about $3 worth of boron. Um, there was still a response to the high rate over the check, but as you can see, the lower rate actually out yielded the high rate. So we've done the same thing with zinc over the years. Uh, we ran into a lot of S15 MESZ products out here. Um, and we've done the same where we'll take the Alpine G22 or the Alpine G22 and HKW add our micronutrients and compare it to those products so we fairly consistently get a yield bump that way as well in terms of the inoculant addition so we have the option through this cool injection system we have the option to add the inoculant right into the fertilizer and put it right in the seed row in your pulse crop so from a convenience standpoint very convenient for the guys that have been doing it we've got a number of these kits out there um, you're not tying up a tank with your granular inoculant. You're not worrying about bridging. Um, there are certain inoculants we don't mix with very well. So what will happen is you'll get some gelling in the manifold. So you want to avoid those ones. Um, there are some that mix very well. So talk to your DSM about that. Um, the ones that come to the top of my mind would be Nodulator and Verdesian that we know do mix well. We're also working with some different products that we think are going to be good. Uh, we're going to do some testing with them as well this spring. But guys have found this to be a very convenient way to inoculate. Um, we've actually seen slight yield bumps in a lot of cases to doing it this way. And anybody that has used it cannot believe how accurate this is. So this is a good option. We're very confident in these. We've been doing this for probably about five or six years now. Um, and we keep getting more and more of these kits out there every year. So if you have any questions on that, um, talk to your, your local Alpine DSM. So that's all I have on the uh, starter side of things. Do we have any questions in on that yet, Shane? Okay, well, I will carry on. So we'll talk about the stage foliar nutrition. So 
what we're talking about when we talk about foliar feeding, it's a little bit, um, there's still a few people out there that get, there's a little bit of a misconception. Some people will consider uh, top dressing UAN or dribble banding a foliar application, but that's not what we're talking about. Um, that would be more what I would consider a top dress where you're actually trying to avoid contact with the UAN and the leaf. Uh, what we're after is actually spraying that product right on the leaf surface. That's where the efficiencies come, come from. And so we'll do that with a flat fan nozzle um, mixed with most of your pesticides in her, out there. there. There's a few things we kind of stay away from um, depending on which product you're using, but for the most part, uh, no issues in terms of compatibility that way. So how does the foliar nutrition work? Well, essentially we get that element into the leaves through the stomata and cuticle. And when we talk about the stomata and and that way of getting that nutrient into the plant what's important to consider is the timing of application so if you're going out there in the heat of the day um, it's 30 above it's dry not a lot of humidity not a great time to put a foliar on that plant is kind of shutting down to conserve moisture and you're going to limit how much we can actually get into that plant so that's something to keep in mind. Now, a lot of guys and a lot of chemical companies are not rec recommending that you apply their product at that time either. So that's a good thing. But in terms of ideal timing, cooler mornings and evenings would be the best time to go out there with your foliar application. So these are kind of what we get out of that foliar app so we can correct nutrient deficiencies. Ideally, we like to not take this approach we'd like to get the product on before we actually see uh, especially a visual de deficiency once we visually see a deficiency in a lot of cases there's only so much you can do yes you can kind of bring it out of that deficiency but you've already lost some yield um, if you're waiting to see that so that's where a tissue test can can kind of come into play try and get that nutrient on before it becomes critically low uh, maybe it's showing kind of medium to low and we can hit it before it gets to the to the deficient side of things we also can stimulate root uptake with this foliar application and i'll talk about how that works here shortly um, combating stress factors very important and the ability to apply certain nutrients at peak crop demand so when you talk about increasing uh, root growth and actually stimulating um, exudate production which essentially allows microbial activity to release nutrients that are already in the soil. So if we can produce sugars, which is what happens when photosynthesis happens, so we're trying to drive photosynthesis. So when we talk about energy production, which I talked about in terms of phosphorus, and there's other nutrients obviously involved in that. But if we can drive photosynthesis, we can drive sugar production, and that sugar production feeds the biology in the soil, and that biology feeds the plant. So if we can stimulate root growth that way and exudate production, we can actually utilize the base applied nutrients better. So when we talk about foliar nutrition, we're not talking about replacing, you know, a massive chunk of your upfront fertility program. We can replace a certain portion, but we're after utilizing those nutrients that you've already put down. We talk about how it affects um, stress factors in the plants so you have your biotic stresses which would be your insects diseases um, those living stresses then you have your abiotics your moisture hail herbicide um, all of these have negative impacts on yield and so the question is are there some things that we can do with foliar nutrition to mitigate some of these impacts on yield and the answer is yes it's like i talked about if we can stimulate that energy production and root growth we can help that plant grow through this stress much quicker. And when you hit it with a herbicide, um, the majority of these herbicides are gonna have to be metabolized by that plant. And when that plant needs to metabolize that compound, it utilizes energy. If that plant is utilizing all its energy to do this, you're gonna basically stall that plant out. And you've probably seen it before, uh, whether it be yellow flash in the plant after you hit it with a certain herbicide um, or certain herbicides that maybe almost cause that crop to stall out and almost quit growing. What we're after is keeping that plant growing, keeping photosynthesis happening so that we are not limiting yield that way. And we can do that with fertility. And there's some different products that we've used. Um, 
you know, if you have a specific nutrient that's limiting, we want to hit it with that. But phosphorus and potassium have been big drivers for us in terms of um, stress, uh, mitigating stress. This gives you an idea of what something like that would look like. Um, this is four days after an application with G22 manganese on oats. You can see the new root growth there, so that's what we're after. As I mentioned, phosphorus is a big part of this. We, we do a lot of it with phosphorus to produce that energy in the plant. Give you an idea, uh, do some different things like this. So the Alpine G22 product, the same product that we're putting in furrow can be used as a foliar because it is primarily an orthophosphate. Um, it can be used, the polyphosphate portion of it is essentially completely useless as a foliar because it will not get into the plant. But the orthophosphate component um, can be utilized by that plant. So it's very, very common. A number of our growers will go out there with a couple liters every time they go through the field. Um, that would be, you know, the most common approach in terms of doing something without a tissue test would be that particular product. Here's on barley, same type of concept. This is with the HKW, so this would be phosphorus and potassium. The G22 again on canola, just to show you, we're kind of doing it on all crops. And here's a summary of a number of trials we've done. Um, we're missing the last few years on this. We have to update it. But um, as you can see, it's just something that works, right? You're going through the field anyway. Chances are there is something that that crop could use. And if you're spending the money to make that pass with your sprayer, please consider looking at some kind of nutrition, even if it's not ours. I mean, just consider it because we consistently get a response to doing nutrition at that time. So now we'll transition into uh, more of a potassium focused talk here, uh, which would be our KTEC product. And I'll get into what exactly KTEC is here shortly. But potassium we know is the second most utilized nutrient by plants uh, next to nitrogen. Uh, the good news about potassium when you see how much um, it uses uh, the plant needs is a lot of that is actually returned to the soil unless we're talking about uh, alfalfa or unless you're baling your straw or something like that removing a lot of that from from the field. Um, a lot of it does get recycled but that doesn't necessarily mean it's available and we know that we need potassium for these different reasons. The big ones uh, that we see a lot visually would be straw strength to help um, mitigate lodging. We know it's important for drought stress tolerance when we talk about the opening and closing of that stomata. Um, I'll show you why that's important. So whenever we get into that situation, which we've run into the last couple of years in Western Canada, that becomes very important. Also important for improving quality of this, the seed um, itself and also important for the use of other nutrients as well. So we talk about straw strength. This is what it looks like. You have on the left hand side uh, a plant that would be deficient in phosphorus or sorry in potassium and, and then the one on the right which has uh, a sufficient amount. So as you can see thinner cell walls, smaller straw strength. Uh, on the right you can see the vascular bundles larger healthier. That's important when we talk about transportation and movement of nutrients and sugars in the plant. If you have that healthy healthy vascular bundle, you're going to help move those nutrients and move those sugars in that plant, which is going to be very important. When we talk about stress tolerance and um, what we can do for that, so this is a little bit confusing, but if you look on the left here, I'll see if my mouse will work. You look on the left here, as we increase the concentration of potassium, and as we increase moisture stress, on the higher levels of potassium, we see that we're still driving photosynthesis. And we know that driving photosynthesis is important for yield production. So if we can keep that plant growing through these types of stresses, we know we can build yield. Now, admittedly, you know, when we get extreme, extreme drought conditions, um, there's only so much you can do with nutrition, but this does go to show you that potassium plays a big role and keeping that plant running and that's what we want to do to drive yield. In terms of helping other nutrients, um, you can see here as we add potassium to higher rates of nitrogen, we can drive yield that way, similar to what I showed before in terms of balanced nutrition, that's all this is here. 
Now getting into different forms um, of potassium or potash, so in Western Canada, especially in, in fact in North America, potassium chloride would be you know, the biggest one, uh, the granular form, we mine it here. Um, there are some other potassium sulfates, um, different things like that that can be used in a granular form. On the liquid side of things, you have your potassium phosphates, your potassium thiosulfates, um, and then in our case, you have the potassium acetate. And so what Alpine KTEC is, is a potassium acetate form. And why that's important is, is just because of the way that that uh, molecule is structured. So it's an inorganic potassium salt and an organic acid, and it is the most soluble form of potassium. And I'll show you why that's important here shortly. Um, Non-corrosive to equipment, which is also very important, especially you're putting through these half a million dollar sprayers or whatever they're worth nowadays, um, and very low in salt content and phytotoxicity. And that is important when we talk about crop safety and leaf burn. If we can keep that phytotoxicity low, that just means that there's less chance for leaf burn. In terms of products that have the KTEC technology in it, um, so when I talk about KTEC, think of these products. We have the Alpine K24. We have the Alpine K20S, which is an NPKS with some boron, calcium, and manganese in there. And we have the Alpine F18 Max, which would be your NPK with some micros as well. So when I talk about KTEC, those are the products that are going to have that form of potassium in them. We do have other products that have potassium in them, but are not necessarily in the, in the uh, potassium acetate form. So just keep that in mind when I talk about that, that form of uh, potassium. We talk about the characteristics of potassium acetate, so this is what makes it um, different and important. We look at this solubility number highlighted in red, so that's why that's important. Um, it's a much smaller molecule, and when you put that into a visual, it looks something like this. So this, get my mouse going again here, this amount of potassium acetate will dissolve in this amount of water. So that goes to show you how soluble this product is. When you see some of these other ones, so let's look at potassium chloride, for example, that's how much potassium chloride you can dissolve in that much water. So this just is a visual of how soluble this product is, which is very important, especially from a foliar aspect, and I'll tell you why that is here shortly. In terms of infero, we're doing some different things with this. Um, the G241S product is a, is a product we've been Working with in, in Eastern Canada, we are um, in the process of looking at a couple different products for Western Canada. Uh, what we're after is making sure that the product will store um, in our colder winters. So we don't have a pre-blended product yet um, for starters with the potassium acetate in there, but we are working on that. But this goes to show you kind of what they've been doing a little bit uh, in Ontario. Same idea here. On this particular trial, the only difference is here is they changed the form of potassium that they used. So the one on the blue, they swapped out that 17% and, and that became a potassium acetate. So the only difference here, the NPK is all the same in terms of the rates, the only difference is the form. So the KTEC versus another form of potassium. On the foliar side of things, as I mentioned, we're going through the field with these sprayers anyway, what can we do? So when we talk about uh, the uniqueness of the potassium acetate of the KTEC technology, because of the solubility of that product, um, it's related to how quickly and how easily it can get into that plant. So when we talk about this fancy word deliquescence, all it really means is at what relative humidity will that stay in solution. So at a lower number, which is what you want to see, at a lower relative humidity, we can keep that nutrient in solution which gives us a greater chance of actually getting it into the plant. And this kind of shows that this is absorption, percent absorption of potassium in soybean leaves. You can see the acetate absorb much quicker and at a much higher rate than these different forms of potassium. So that's why that structure of that particular nutrient is very important. We talk about peak demand, how that plays a role. Well, we know that the crop goes through different demands for those nutrients throughout the season. And we know a big one for potassium and a lot of nutrients for that matter is when we go from vegetative to reproductive stage. So in this case, this is corn. You go from the V12 stage to the R1 stage. You can see there's a big draw in potassium at that time. Same thing with cereals, vegetative to reproductive, big draw in nutrients at that time. Canola, 
pulses, they're all the same, right? So the idea is, is even if we have a good upfront potassium uh, fertility package, even if the soil test levels seem to be quite high, that doesn't necessarily mean that that plant is able to access that nutrient quick enough. And what we found, and it started a number of years ago um, in Western Canada, we had a lot of success with foliar feeding potassium sources and not even potassium acetate at this time. We didn't have access to that product, but foliar feeding potassium kind of at that early flower on, on pulses. And we had great, great success with that. And now we're doing it on every crop. And what we know is because there's a big demand at that time, we can drive yield as we go into that reproductive stage. The trick is sometimes making sure that we've got enough moisture there that the plant is still growing. Chances are, um, if it's super dry, you're probably not going out with fungicide anyway. So some guys will do a separate application as long as there's enough moisture there to keep driving that plant. But in a lot of cases, this is going in with a fungicide app because the timing is very similar to when we want to get that potassium into that plant. Going to do a little bit of trial info, and this will be kind of towards the tail end of the presentation, so it won't keep you guys too much longer. Um, this is the F18 Max. This is uh, data that we've collected out of the U.S. Average of 4.9 bushel response, 76% of the time um, we got a response, so we don't win every single time. No product out there does, but just goes to show you there's a lot of consistency with this product. This is a potato trial for any of the Manitoba guys or Saskatchewan guys we may have on here. Um, for potatoes, this would be a, a KTEC pro program with the K24, as well as that F18 Max um, foliar fed. This is a wheat trial from last year. A very, very good response in this case to some potassium uh, acetate uh, or KTEC through either the K20S or the F18 Max in this case. Same thing, uh, this was done at Old Alberta, not as good a response to the F18 Max, but it's still a pretty good bump to a uh, little bit of phosphorus and potassium. Canola, same thing, the K20S and the F18 Max. This was the canola trial at Old's, the third party stuff last year. Again, very, very good response to a little bit of foliar nutrition here. So what we're trying to do with this KTEC and, and what it does for us is it help maintain, helps maintain that balance that I talked about um, early on. So that kind of wraps up that portion. Um, I'll buzz through this quickly just to kind of let you guys know what our plot program looks like. Some of the stuff we do is third party and the rest of it, um, Daryl does a fantastic job for us uh, in putting these plots in just to give you an idea of how we do some of these, some of these plots. Um, this is our drill that we'll go and, and we'll seed them with um, in terms of the starter nutrition plots. We can do them that way. We've got lots of different combinations of dry liquid inferro side band, um, pretty much anything you can think of. Uh, we will spray some of our plots. Uh, some of them will be cooperators that do the foliar plots for us. This gives you an idea of uh, kind of what they look like. So. We're trying to do field scale research. Uh, we're working on actually increasing our replications um, this, this coming year. So we try to do, in the past, we've tried to replicate three or four times. We're gonna maybe try to get that, that up to um, six to eight replications if we can. The, the issue is sometimes just field variability, but we're, we're looking at a couple different ways that we can uh, combat that. Here's our plot combine uh, that we use to take these off. We actually have a scale right in the hopper. Um, so we can we can read those yields right on the go. And that is all I have for you guys. Um, any questions?